Um, yesterday you were already anticipating a number of things I'm going to address today. You had some very good questions yesterday based on that preliminary stuff we got. So hopefully today I'll answer that, some of those things. Ideally, we'd love to have every specimen have audio recording, uh, all, a, a whole suite of data. Uh, unfortunately, that hasn't been the case throughout history. As you can imagine, many of those original specimens that were collected back in the 1700s and 1800s often didn't even have locality data. It might say West Africa. And when Linnaeus and people were describing some of those, all they had was West Africa. And so there were a minimal amount of data on some of those birds. And of course, when a bird, or whatever organism it is, that specimen that the description of the species is based on, that's referred to as a holotype. And I think Rafe and Gang will be talking more about holotypes, paratypes, and so forth later. But that's, there's usually a designation of one specimen that is the holotype for that species description. Again, very minimal amount of data on those earlier specimens when the vast majority of organisms were described. Today, we have all kinds of more data associated with, we refer to them as data-rich specimens, and I'm gonna go through the details of those kinds of data that you wouldn't have had on those specimens collected even 50 years ago. These days, we take a field prep uh, catalog that actually has prompts of data, like there's a field catalog number here, the scientific name, Obviously, locality is up here. And if we were had locality for this site, it would be uh, Cameroon, Southwest Province. And say we went up the, on the slope up here and we were on the east slope of Mount Cameroon, we'd have that and we'd have coordinates, elevation. And then we start recording all this data. I know this is hard to read, but these categories help prompt us as we're preparing the specimen, we write down those data as we prep the specimen. Here's a KU student that's preparing a, um, a morning dove, very thin-skinned bird. Uh, not many, one of, many of us like to do these birds because they're so thin-skinned. And one of the questions you asked yesterday, what is in a prepared specimen, that previous example? What, what is in here? What's left? Well, obviously, we have to extract almost all the meat, otherwise the thing will rot. So you lose the iris. You lose a lot of... Um, muscle and so forth, you have to remove all that. So in essence, all you have in this specimen is cotton with a wood dowel to give it support. So here's an uh, example. This is a hummingbird. It's one of the smallest uh, birds in the world. In fact, it rivals the smallest hummingbird in the world. This is from the island of Hispaniola in the Caribbean. Uh, it's called a vervain flycatch or uh, hummingbird. This thing weighed, I think, about 2.5 grams, give you an idea of how small this was. And note, on the front of the tag, we have full locality information, elevation, coordinates, the date that it was collected, not the date that it was prepared, but the date it was collected, and then the field prep number, and then the, usually we put the symbol of the sex of the, the, the bird. This number here is the ultimate catalog number that we use and the kinds of information uh, that you can see on this particular back side of this tag, this is on the flip side, actually this thing weighed 2.2 grams. That's unbelievable how small this thing is. And remember on birds, the gonads are internally, so you need to open up a bird, particularly when they're uh, uh, monomorphic, the sexually mon monomorphic, where the males and females are just like each other. The only way to tell them apart is to look at the gonads and we record the size of gonads. That's all of it. Ob uh, ob oftentimes the only indication of whether the bird's in breeding condition or not. And in this particular example, uh, we have the ovary mass is six by three and a half. The oviduct is very small. So this bird was not breeding. We also have, as I mentioned, the weight. And then we have a couple of aging characteristics. So hummingbirds have a unique thing in that you can look at striations in the bill to tell if it's an adult and immature. Now that's unique to hummingbirds. Most birds you can't look at the bill morphology and tell if it's an adult or immature. But we have other aging characteristics and we're going to be pointing those out to you in camp where we look at the skull ossification, the presence of a, an organ for the first year of its life. Those kinds of things give us ideas of the age of the bird. We also note molt and then um, one of the 
things you'll notice is tissue number, and that's what this is right here. This is a separate number from the ultimate catalog number. These days we take tissue of everything we prepare. And I'm going to talk about examples of when we don't have tissue samples of specimens that are maybe 150 years old, how we extract genetic data from those. But for these modern specimens on this particular upcoming field camp we're going to have, every specimen, whether it's a herp or bird, we will be taking genetic material. Uh, and this is a cryogenic tube. Uh, ultimately, we're going to put in the field alcohol with these thin, sli thin slices of muscle in a tube. Once we get back to the Institute, they'll, that alcohol will be poured off and they'll be put in a cryogenic facility in liquid nitrogen. Actually not submerged in the, uh, the liquid, but in a vapor la layer where they'll be kept indefinitely. Here's a field tissue catalog. Uh, this must be Towns writing, it's so messy. That can't be mine. <laughs> So this is yet another catalog. I, I showed you that field catalog as we're prepping, we're writing down the information, it has all those prompts. Well, this is our tissue catalog, and on this, you've got the prep, person's prep number and this unique number that goes on that tube that I just showed. There's often uh, all kinds of uh, associated ancillary information we like to attach with uh, specimens, and this can range from photographs, this specimens depicting soft part colors. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Um, there may be, if we make a skin of something, there might be some key skeletal elements we want to keep, part of the skeleton. Uh, we often do spread wing. If we have audio recordings with that particular specimen, that will be referenced on the specimen tag, and ultimately that w sound file will be associated with the specimen. If we're uh, on an expedition where we're collecting parasites, You've seen in a couple of slides, I think Ray showed some slides yesterday that had this P number, a parasite number, on the expeditions we've done to China and elsewhere. We've actually collected both ectoparasites as well as endoparasites. And then obviously photographs of habitat. You'll be seeing us out in the forest just taking pictures of the habitat. All that will be associated with the group of specimens that are collected at any particular site. So to give you an example of at least in birds, how things change dramatically. This is an Indo-Chinese green magpie. This is from uh, Vietnam. And the things I want you to note, one, iris color, we're gonna lose that, obviously we're removing the eyes. And as I mentioned yesterday, often within a few minutes of death, the iris of a bird can change colors. Note how bright orange red this bill is, and it has this orange eye ring. And notice how intensive that yellow is. Well, here's what happens in a very short amount of time. Obviously we lost the eye, that's cotton in the eye. The bill is already faded on this bird. It's lost that uh, nice orange color to it. The eye ring has shrunk up and become discolored. And look how this is already faded. Uh, some of these uh, carotid uh, pigments are notorious for being unstable and it's often associated with their diet. And there's some uh, species where Literally, if you collect a specimen and you wrapped them in a black cloth so they weren't exposed to any sunlight whatsoever and you put them in a cabinet and as little as a, one or two months later, you pull that out and it's faded dramatically. In fact, there have been subspecies described on museum specimens where they pulled them out and they said, oh, these are really pale. This is a very distinct from these uh, other specimens from a different uh, geographic locality. Some of them have been named like pallidus because they're paler than the, the other described subspecies. So there's a lot of that you have to know about some of the pigments in these things when you're looking at describing new taxa. And that, these guys will be covering the description of these things later this week. Uh, as I mentioned, we uh, often make full skeletons. When Town and I arrived at Kansas 21 years ago, uh, the University of Kansas um, ornithological collection was known for having the most skeletons from any university on the planet. Well, things that have changed since then because with um, these micro, there's many CAT scans, we realize that it's often better just to leave the skeleton totally intact with the whole specimen. When those specimens we preserve as fluid preserved specimens like the herb guys routinely do, we do that for a subset of the birds we collect 
And instead of making a separate skeleton, you have that complete skeleton there that's articulated and has all the muscle attachments. We're doing more and more of preserving that whole specimen versus a separate skeleton. Now, and, and I should point out, this little thing up there, that's a casing from a beetle. And many collections clean their skeletons when we're in the field. We'll strip off the feathers, a lot of the meat, and we wrap it with a string and let it dry. And then we get back to the institute. We have a special bug colony. They're domestic uh, beetles. And actually this uh, technique that was devised at the University of Kansas, the story goes, a biologist at KU was out in western Kansas, the state where, you are, where the institute is, and found a coyote skin and noticed all these beetles were chewing on the meat and so forth. And he thought, wow, we could use that to clean skeletons. So many institutions across the planet actually use beetles to clean the skeletons. And so when they come out of this bug room, they're pretty clean like this and we don't do anything else. There's no chemicals uh, associated with this. They used to wash these with ammonia and so forth, but our philosophy is not to introduce any mechanical or chemical things to these specimens to try to keep them in their state because we don't know how these things might be used down the road. So we don't want to contaminate them. Yes, Tom. You might point out one thing that's missing from this is a final skeleton specimen, the numbering. Oh, yeah, the numbering. <laughs> so for each one of these specimens, you have a catalog, and each bone needs to have that catalog number written on it in permanent ink. Because you can imagine, if you're comparing this particular individual with an individual of the same species, and you're matching those bones, it might be easy to mix them up. So that's why it's critical that we number each bone. In some instances, we have a, a low density bird or a rare bird where we may not get more than one specimen and we realize there might not even be a skeleton world, but the plumage is really critical. So this is called, this preparation is called SMU and notice the bill's missing and almost all the skeletal elements have been removed and you have almost a complete skeleton associated with this skin. Doesn't look very pretty but all the information is there. As I mentioned, we're doing more and more of these fluid-based specimens versus a full skeleton, and you've seen um, uh, specimens in alcohol, so I'm not even gonna show you an example of that. Another thing that we often do, because many birds have unique plumage in the wing often used for display, and this group is classically known for that. This is a night jar. These are nocturnal or crepuscular birds. And often the males have these striking wing patterns. So we'll often pull off a wing on these and have that because on that study skin, you notice how the wings were fold against the body. You, you miss that whole wing pattern. Here in this area, here in West, yeah, Western Africa, you have one of the, this is another night jar of the same family as the bird I just showed you before. This is the most extreme in, in the whole bird world of modified primary feathers that you can see. This is a modified feather. That, that's the base of it going into the inner uh, primaries. This is a male displaying. They have this for just a few months of the year. That bird passes through here as a migrant, right through here in Cameroon. Another extreme example of that is this pennant wing night jar, extraordinary uh, plumage, these modified primaries for um, display. Talked a little bit uh, yesterday about audio recording equipment. I won't rehash some of that. Uh, ideally, we'd love to have with every specimen a vocalization, but oftentimes we can't do that. Um, but if we can, those data, unfortunately in the past, many of the audio recordings were in people's private collections and there was no uh, uniform place to archive this material. Well, at least on our side of the world, there are two places where you can deposit material that will eventually be put online. And in fact, recordings from this upcoming trip we're about to do, the field work, they will be online for any of you to listen to at the Macaulay Library probably within a couple of months of us getting back. 
So ideally, we, every recording uh, should be archived. Uh, Macaulay Library is working on it where if you go out and record, you will be able to upload that soon. And the guys at Zeno Canto have already designed their website that way where if you go to just type in Zeno Canto, type in Africa, you can bring up any species where the recordings, you know, from anywhere in the world, a number from here in Cameroon, bring those up and you can actually listen to those and look at them spectrographically. Ideally, those are tied to a specimen. Now this is um, just to give you a, an idea of the data that you associate with an audio recording. This is not, certainly not all the fields, but I want to just give you an idea. Here's the scientific name over here. The time of day, uh, the day, the month, the locality, coordinates, elevation, what song type, whether it was a song, a call. Mechanically produced, many birds produce sounds by uh, rubbing their feathers together. You have uh, the actual social context in which he's occurred, whether the bird was in flight, whether it was countersing with another individual, on and on and on. So there's many, many it's 30 to 40 fields associated with that single audio recording that's tied, hopefully, with a specimen. So Mark, uh, sorry, just yeah. go back one. Mm -hmm. How do you, if you go out next week, you record 100 birds in the course of a week. How do you remember all of that to pass it on to the forum? Good point. So after each recording, I'll put an announcement right then, what time it is that was recorded, the conditions, where, how many meters the bird was above the ground or if it was on the ground, whether it was counter singing with another individual. So I put as much information on there as I can. It usually doesn't go into notebook because when you're transcribing stuff from that audio recording, one, it takes time, but also that original information is right there associated with that re original recording. So hopefully I've, when I've finished up recording a particular song, I associate all that data verbally on a, the audio. Uh, I should mention that when we're characterizing an avifauna, I'm not out there just recording a single individual of each species. We're trying to characterize the entire uh, species vocal repertoire. So I try to every day record as many individuals of each species as possible. And each morning, you know, yesterday I mentioned that oftentimes even when birds are not breeding, right at dawn, a territorial individual will sing just for maybe less than a minute. So each morning I make sure that I'm at, at a different site in the forest or, or whatever habitat we're in. And at that critical point at 6 a.m., I'm standing there for when those first individuals are calling to be able to capture them. Otherwise, you miss a larger part of the fauna if you're routine, routinely starting at the same spot. Observational data. Um, in the past, People have just put this in their field notes and unless you know about those field notes, it's kind of lost data. These days, we can actually enter the, the observational data on an online database for the whole planet. And J uh, Jacob will be talking about that in detail here in a few minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and give you a few examples of what you can do with these specimens. Obviously. The basic inventory, we're providing information for an area. Uh, if it's an area that is not a national park or not a reserve, those data may help us design parks in areas where there is no reserve. So that's obviously one of the critical things from, that we can get from specimens. But there are other things. And this is an artist and author of Birds of Peru. Notice he has these small flycatchers in front of him and he's uh, depicting those based on specimens. So every field guide you ever see is based on specimens. And here's an end product. Here's after a book has been published. Notice he's got a bird in the hand and can compare that directly to that to make an accurate uh, identification of a bird in the field. So one of uh, the largest collections at KU is this house sparrow collection, Passer domesticus. It's a bird that's native to, primarily to Europe. 
back in the 1800s, late 1800s, that bird was introduced throughout the planet. And we had an ornithologist at KU who was interested in documenting change in vertebrates. Easy to document change in things like insects like Drosophila, where you have rapid uh, regeneration time and you can look at mutations really quickly. Much more difficult to document that in something that has a much longer generation time, such as vertebrates. So back in the 1960s, this ornithologist and his students went out and collected house sparrows throughout the whole planet where they'd been introduced, because we knew exactly when they'd been introduced, and looked at whether there were changes in that species over just 100 years. Back then, there was no genetic data, so they just measured wing length, tail length, and they also measured the coloration, and lo and behold, they found differences in that short amount of time. So we have two or three cabinets. These towns showed, I think, a photograph yesterday of these cabinets that are much taller than I, filled with house sparrows. We have about, I think, 13,000 plus house sparrows. Since then, with genetic data, uh, sequencing data, there was a student from the University of California who came in and there was no t uh, tissue collected at the time that these were, but they were able to go in and take a little slice from the toe pad and sequence genetic data from that toe pad. And here's an example of a bird, unfortunately it's extinct, it was the only native parakeet in North America, it's called the Carolina parakeet. During a uh, town in my career, the common thought was that it was most closely related to this thing that was just found just to the south in Mexico called green parakeet. That was what everyone thought for a long time. And then in 2012, uh, some ornithologists went in and they pulled off a little uh, skin from the toe pad of one of these extinct individuals and sequenced it. And quite surprisingly, here's, that's the scientific name of Carolina parakeet. Instead of being uh, what we thought would be as close as relative right here, this is, a, I should explain, this is a phylogenetic tree. I think Rafe and, and Dave may uh, give you the nuts and bolts on this later in the week. For now, we'll take this at face value. I'm not gonna describe what these, these numbers mean. But these, it's a tree of relationships. So this is Carolina parakeet here, and it turns out it's related to a couple of parrots, not in Mexico, but in South America. And this is one of the closest relatives called black hooded parakeet. Totally unexpected that the closest relative to this extinct parakeet is in South America. And uh, give you a that bird I just showed you, the black hooded parakeet, that's the scientific name of it. It's this thing is closely related, more closely related to that than it is to what we thought down here, the, the green parakeet. The other uh, close relative is called the sun parakeet. And probably an assumption we can make about the relationships of these birds is that this is, th that bird I just showed you is right here called sun parakeet, is that Given this distribution pattern and uh, the relationships here, it's likely that the number of close relatives of this particular group of relatives became extinct. Because given that you have birds sitting in the southeast United States and the closest relatives are down in South America, we suspect that there were things in between that probably became extinct. So this is just an example of what you can do with specimens uh, to look at relationships, to generate field guides, uh, provide a baseline for future comparisons. And as you'll hear more about this as the morning goes along.